I want to welcome all of you. I'm Chris Knopp, and I have the great honor of being Executive Director of Friends of the Boundary Waters, and we have a really great program here today uh, talking about accessibility in the Boundary Waters. And uh, we often talk about being equitable and inclusive, and, and this is really taking it taking that issue seriously and taking a, a deep dive in, into that. And so we have um, uh, two uh, panelists today that'll help lead us through. We have Riss, uh, Riss uh, Leitsky from Wilderness Inquiry and, and Sean Leary of uh, the North of North uh, Resort outside of Ely here. And we, we have our, our interpreter here, Alyssa, uh, will we'll help facilitate this. Uh, uh, Riss uh, uh, is uh, is deaf, and so we'll be using an interpreter here as, as part of that. And, and thank you, Alyssa, for um, for facilitating this. And so um, so we'll have a, a conversation among all of us that are, are part of this, including all the all the all the the guests on this. And so for guests, if you want to uh, add a, a comment, there's the chat function at the bottom, and there's also the Q and A a Q and A function, and you can add those comments and, and those questions throughout the program. And we'll try to interject that throughout the program and have Riss and, and Sean um, uh, uh, respond to those. And we'll also allow time at the end of this program that'll last uh, an hour here for, for questions for the next, uh, uh, for the last 10 minutes or so. So um, maybe we can, uh, Maggie, we'll take this up. Uh, the slide down here so people can better see uh, our faces here. So there's all, all our faces here right now. And, uh, and it's, uh, the, the, everyone has a story and everyone has interesting stories. And I'd like, um, uh, as we approach this topic of, of accessibility, have, uh, uh, have uh, Riss uh, talk a little bit about uh, about how you came to uh, came to your your position at Wilderness Inquiry uh, and and um, uh, your your journey there. So, so Riz, why don't you kick it off and provide some background about yourself? Hello, everyone. My name is Riz. It's my sign name, and my pronouns are they them. I've worked at Wilderness Inquiry for about three and a half years as the accessibility uh, coordinator. Myself, I am deafblind. I have low vision, and that's related to Usher syndrome, which means that my peripheral vision is really what's impacted, but also at night, I'm fully blind. Growing up myself, I actually didn't think much about the outdoors. I didn't think that was something that I'd be able to experience and enjoy. There's bugs, it's dirty. I just didn't know. But then during high school, my friend really wanted to work at this outdoor experience for the summer for one month, no showers, no toilets, nothing like that. They said, come on and join me. I said, no, I'm good, I'll pass. But then my friend told my parents and my parents thought, oh, why wouldn't you just go ahead? That sounds great, get comfortable in the outdoors. So go ahead. I thought, well, shoot, okay, I'll do it. For that month, that really changed my perspective. Now I learned that I could enjoy the outdoors, plus I could work in the outdoors. I also noticed during that time that there were not a lot of folks who experienced disabilities in the outdoors, something you didn't see. So I thought, okay, I'll get involved by volunteering and doing internships at different organizations. And then I went to UMD and I specifically majored in outdoor education. So during that four years, I noticed that the curriculum didn't really expose people to people with disabilities in the outdoors. They teach a little bit about accommodations, but I also had to learn to teach them about how to make accommodations and how to provide accommodations in the curriculum to work with people with disabilities, whether it's being creative with equipment or um, providing universal design whatever it may be. So at the end of my college experience, I decided to join Wilderness Inquiry. It felt like they were, their mission aligned with my goals, whether it's through universal design. Um, and then in my role, I also look at participant and staff evaluations to make sure that trips are being truly accommodating to folks with different experiences of disabilities. 
And so we try to take all of that data and provide accommodations. And then one example of that is we've recently developed the ASL Communication Facilitator Fellowship. That program is for recent interpreter uh, program uh, graduates who maybe don't feel quite ready to get out into the professional field. They can join us and they can work work on their skills. And there's not a lot of interpreters right now in the outdoors. So they can really practice and figure out how to uh, interpret in those settings. They can also build their skills as an interpreter, matching the different needs of each deaf or deafblind or hard of hearing participant or staff member. And at the end of that, they'll feel really confident in how they not only can interpret, but set up boundaries and feel comfortable going out into the professional world. So the goal is that at the end, they can work as a professional interpreter. To yourself. And, uh, thanks, Sean. I'll, I'll kick it off and, and have uh, you uh, introduce yourself and how, how you came into the space here, too. Thanks, thanks, Chris. Yeah, um, I'm Sean Leary. Um, I'm a proud owner of North of North Resort and um, a founder of uh, Adaptive Wilderness Within Reach, uh, or AWWR, or R if you howl it out like you can, if you want to have some fun. That's the name of our nonprofit. So a bit about myself. Um, I am in a wheelchair. And so um, can't really see too much right now, but, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, I, when I was 18, I was in a, a motor vehicle accident, uh, after high school graduation. And, uh, since that time, the last 23 years, I've been uh, using a manual wheelchair, uh, I have a spinal cord injury. I grew up an avid outdoorsman, um, fishing, kayaking, canoeing, uh, winter sports. I was a snowboarder. I loved the mountains. I loved, I loved it all. And, um, and so, um, it was kind of devastating, uh, of course, uh, when I, when, when I had to adapt, uh, myself, uh, to the reality that, uh, a lot of, uh, outdoor recreation wasn't going to be really available to me, uh, as it had been in the past. And I'd kind of lived in that reality for quite some time, grew up, you know, went to college, got a degree from St. John's university here, um. I'm an environmental consultant uh, by trade, and uh, and so um, I kind of moved on a little bit from uh, you know giving up some of the things I loved. Unfortunately, um, then I had children, and uh, and my young daughters. I was trying to give them some of those same experiences, and uh, it was really on a trip to Yellowstone National Park where uh, we were way out there and, uh, and, you know, doing things, pushing ourselves, you know, in, in ways for us as a, as a family that, uh, we kind of developed this kind of dream of doing what we ended up doing, uh, up, up in Northern Minnesota, you know, it was kind of, again, disappointing that, uh, coming back to the state here with that, uh, there wasn't more places, uh, for folks who had significant disabilities to be able to launch an excursion out of, you know, uh, despite having more, you know, miles of uh, shoreline than any state but Alaska, uh, we don't have great access to that water, uh, folks with disabilities, I mean, when I say that. So, yeah, this became kind of the dream, the passion project. Um, uh, my wife and I uh, started with a piece of undeveloped land. There was nothing here. And um, we bush crashed just like we did in Canada when we were canoe guides, uh, <laughs> but in a, in, a, in a closer to the highway, that's for sure. But I learned what I could do in a chair, you know, even out on the land, just, just making trails and camping and figuring out all the permitting those first, that first year, and then, and then moving into construction camping the second year. And, uh, uh, but now we're open as of uh, August, we're, we're fully open and, uh, uh, folks are making reservations, we're getting five-star reviews, and we're loving uh, all that's coming with uh, this phase of it is, is so much more fun. Uh, the nonprofit um, is uh, hitting, hitting uh, you know, starting out with kind of a bang, you might say. Um, we've had a lot of support from the community. Um, and especially from the state of Minnesota, uh, where we received an innovation grant this past year, 
to uh, just this past summer for the next two years where we have excursions uh, funded through the resort. So we've been uh, doing a lot of fishing and kayaking and, uh, excursions in August and September. Uh, we had an adaptive wild rice harvest there uh, with some uh, local indigenous guides uh, in September. And um, now we're moving into hard water season here um, um, and, and, and looking at dog sledding uh, out on the lake and in the trails uh, surrounding the area. So uh, that and, and ice fishing. And uh, we also are looking at cross country sit skiing. So those are our kind of winter activities. So it's just our first uh, first year. So uh, we're learning a lot, um, but uh, we're seeing a ton of interest in people coming out to the resort, using what we've built, um, you know, partnering with our guides and, and, and our resources to make their Minnesota adventure come true, you know, their dreams come true for what, what could happen in the woods uh, for folks with significant disabilities. Great. Thank, thank you, Sean. That, thank you. That's quite a, quite a, a journey that you've had there. Uh, I'll, I'll start off by asking a, a, a philosophical question or, or maybe a, a one that connects with your emotions. You know, Riss, what, what does the wilderness and what does the outdoor mean to you? And, and what do you get from the outdoors? So that word wilderness means that you should not feel limitations. People should not decide who can access and who can't access spaces. That word means that it's generally public and open to everyone, whether it's the Boundary Waters or another area, whether they have disabilities, it doesn't matter. People should be able to experience that space. But wilderness can also mean a diverse set of experiences depending on the individual. Not everybody who experiences the outdoors experiences it in the same way. Some people personally love the forest and others maybe don't, but it's all about that personal growth and connecting to people who have that shared experience and values. And sometimes I feel like people are also more vulnerable in the outdoors and so that allows that connection to grow and happen as well so that's what it means to me thank, thank you Chris. very powerful and, and sean i'll present the same question to you what is the wilderness and what does the outdoors mean mean to you i i think it's riz put it really well it's a place where you can connect with people and break down barriers so there's an interpersonal uh aspect to it um, even if you go alone, though, uh, the solitude that comes with wilderness and experiencing wilderness. In fact, sometimes all I really want to do is go out on the kayak alone. <laughs> and on a still day, that's magic out on the water. And uh, and so, you know, these experiences, whether it's, you know, looking up and seeing the Milky Way because, you know, there's not lights that are drowning it out or, uh, you know, um, being out on a, on a calm day at sunset uh, they connect us with you know a deeper a deeper spot uh, within us all that uh, it can bring healing it can bring you know mental health I think it's physical even uh, certainly uh, getting out there has a lot of advantages for uh, folks uh, you know all abilities you know uh, so using what you've got uh, is an important thing so, um, but the community uh, specifically for folks with disabilities, uh, an aspect is really big thing because uh, uh, for instance, our, our guides we work with, they're fully committed to, to our mission and, uh, and they're in the community. And uh, you know, when you partner with people like that, you create deeper bonds and uh, it's all about the wilderness and access to the wilderness. That's, that's what's at the heart of it. Great. Uh, thank, thank you, Sean. And Riz, why don't you talk a little bit about more of your work at Wilderness Inquiry and 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 how you're uh, connecting people of, of 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 various backgrounds and various abilities and and uh, to the wilderness and uh, and and what and and 
uh, what you find so meaningful about that. So like I mentioned in high, sc high school, I had some brief you know, internships and experiences with wilderness inquiry. And the first time I went to the Boundary Waters actually was on a wilderness inquiry trip. And that really opened my mind to seeing how different individuals with a variety of disabilities could experience and share that experience together, but also share their, uh, their perspectives. I think I was 16 maybe when this trip took place. And at that time, I was also fascinated in seeing how the folks at Wilderness Inquiry engaged with folks who have disabilities and worked with them. And I felt that they really were building a relationship with the organization and people were feeling very lucky and, and connecting and getting involved in different ways, whether it was through events or different trips. I really felt a deep connection there. <clears throat> and so, you know, if I meet somebody and I ask, have you ever been in the outdoors or do you enjoy the outdoors? If they say, no, not yet, I invite them and try to bring them along on that journey and build that community and, and also building that trust, really. I think I want to make sure that, you know, they understand they can experience this, they can enjoy this. And maybe they don't know quite who I am or don't know who we are as an organization, but it's really about building that foundational relationship and then going from there to encourage them to try different things. Maybe starting with a day trip. So some of the pictures you see on the side here, this is the ASL Winter Fest, which I think the first year was 2022. We had different people from the community come for the first time, try snowshoeing, try using cross country skis. They build a Quincy. And it was just amazing to see how they could carve out that snow and build it themselves and create a safe, warm space inside. And they learned how to start fires. So a lot of different skills that they learned during that event. So that's one way that we start to build connections with the deaf, deaf, blind, and hard of hearing and ASL users in our community is really building those connections, not just with us, but with each other. And then from there, you know, we keep trying to build on that. So maybe they'll do a one overnight trip. Maybe they'll do something a little longer. And then we have affinity trip programs as well, where they can go on trips where everybody is of the same community, whether that's deaf, deaf, blind, and hard of hearing, neurodivergent, LGBTQ+, all sorts of options there as well. And then we make sure that the staff working on those trips also identify with those affinity groups. So that way we try to match and, and match the communication and culture of, of those participants. And that makes them feel that much more comfortable during the trip. Thank you. Riz, how many people go through the, this program each year? Oof. Um, okay, so I didn't, we didn't count in 2022 for the ASL Winterfest. I know that was a pretty small event. Last year in 2023, I think that was around 200, 200 deaf, deaf, blind, and hard of hearing folks that came. This year, we're hoping for around 400 people. So we've really been growing that community and, and driving that growth. Plus, now we also have outdoor leaders that are deaf, deaf, blind, and hard of hearing as well. And so we're growing that staff, uh, which helps grow the community. Great. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And Sean, maybe you want to describe where... Uh, where your resort is located and and, and physically just de describe it. I think you have a really a real love for and a connection to to the land and water there. That's that's very much true. Um, the resort, you know, Ely is a treasure. Uh, the whole area, no doubt. Um, but we feel that uh, where we are, our location um, at the mouth of uh, 
the Kwishui River where it meets uh, Birch Lake, uh, just on the lake, um, on the far northeastern portion. We're looking uh, westward here down the lake uh, is, a, is, a, is a really a treasure. Um, what you see around you is uh, Superior National Forest and uh, protected lands. Um, and on the left side of the screen, um, of course, the proposed location uh, for the Twin Metals Mine. Um, if you looked across the road behind us, you'd, it, it would be more protected land. So we're on this sort of island. It was a government outlaw. And it's a really unique uh, property because it has an upland forest area. It has a lowland marsh that connects it to a, a peninsula. And uh, that makes for an ecological setting where you have upland and then you have marsh and then you have an island type setting. And um, we have, you know, we're, we're, if you look at the dark sky maps, you know, where we're in the dark skies, you know, uh, as opposed to uh, other areas where you'll see, die, you know, you'd see docks, docks, docks up and down the lake. Um, here, we don't, we don't really have uh, much for neighbors at all. And so we're on the edge of it all. Um, and yet we're 10 miles from Ely. And so you can bump into town very quickly. And, and, uh, and so, um, you know, we feel that uh, there's unfortunately not many places like this uh, because we see uh, what's happening with lakeshore development uh, and, and the pace of it all. It's really interesting if you go out onto the lake and you look back at the resort because of this um, peninsula, you really can't see these cabins very much at all. Uh, we, our impact on the lake uh, is minimal um, for what anyone is gonna see. And uh, we, we believed in building with uh, uh, the land, we call it design with nature. Um, but, you know, um, you know, basically not having to fill any wetlands on a site that had plenty of wetlands. Um, you know, we could have done up to 11 units here based on the 1100 feet of shoreline that we had to have. And uh, we did three uh, because that was what was appropriate. So, um, you know, just, it's a treasure of an area and um, we wanted, we wanted everyone to be able to experience it, of course, um, you know, with, with our mission being that, uh, you know, to kind of overcome what has become, unfortunately, in the world of uh, Airbnbs, uh, an ever increasingly kind of hostile place for folks with disabilities and their ability to access uh, accommodations. Uh, you know, in, in similar settings, uh, just because things aren't regulated very much when it comes to Airbnbs. Uh, we're, we're regulated at resort, as a resort, and, uh, and we built all three units uh, accessible uh, because we didn't want anybody to have to worry about taking anyone else's accessible unit. Uh, all of our units are accessible. So yeah, this is a look back in, in the river that's flowing here, the Kuishui, you can see where it meets the lake uh, right here. And that's all, you know, water that's leaving the boundary waters extremely clean any of the weeds you see in the water that's wild rice that grows around uh, around the docks area so uh, we've got you know pristine waters and and uh, undeveloped neighbors and it's just a it's, it's a real beautiful area so come up and support our mission great Sean you pointed out the wild rice that we can see in this this picture here if I'm not mistaken right right across the the shore uh, where the proposed Twin Metals site is located. There's wild rice that grows all along that stretch. If I That's correct. We, we riced that, um, and it's been, you know, really multi-year problem for the, for the rice, but it's, it's unfortunately every year getting to be more and more difficult. And uh, we did, as part of our wild rice harvest, we surveyed nine lakes nearby, uh, all of them rice lakes, and this was the strongest rice we could find in the area. And so... It was harvestable. It wasn't uh, the geese had really gotten after it, but it was uh, there. Are, there are wild rice beds up and down this side of the lake. Yes, loaded with fish too, by the way. And uh, maybe talk about your your work with uh, uh, some boys sport band members and, and the wild rice in there. Yeah, we had a, a gentleman named Rory Wakeham up, who is a, a artist and moose hunter and wild ricer and real. Uh, character of a guy um, come up and lead a two-week wild rice harvest. Um, we had uh, members of the Boys Fort Band participate, folks who were disabled, 
got a, a local attorney who's uh, in, in the Boys Fort Band who raced as a child up on Net Lake here and, and hasn't been able to do it since then. But uh, uh, in the just just off the island here, we have our adaptive kayak launch and we adapted kayaks to be able to use for ricing. And uh, and we got out there and ate walleye with moose steaks and wild rice. And it was kind of the perfect Minnesota surf and turf, if you will. <laughs> so. And we have that planned for next year as well. We plan to just expand the event. Uh, it's part of our, our grant. Uh, it was one of our proposed events for the grant. So, Super. Thank you. And and Chris, why don't you talk a little bit more about what, what Wilderness Inquiry does broadly and that and the sort of the uh, inclusive philosophy that Wilderness Inquiry has and, and, and the various programs that Wilderness Inquiry has. So Wilderness Inquiry started in 1979. And prior to that, a man named Greg Lace, he saw that there was a senator at the time who really wanted to build and develop the boundary waters and different roads and was taking advantage of the people of, of the disability community, senior citizens, trying to take advantage of the mission of making it more accessible. And so he proposed, he proposed this and Greg and some of his friends, they took some folks who were deaf and somebody who used a wheelchair and a few other folks joined them on a trip to the Boundary Waters to figure out how they could really break down those barriers and make the Boundary Waters more accessible. And it worked. So they proved that senator wrong and the senator admitted it and said, okay, I give up this fight. We won't build in the boundary waters. And then from there, Greg and his group of friends were able to start Wilderness Inquiry in 1979. From there, it's really grown quite a bit. The focus has always been for making things to be with uh, more accessible for folks experiencing disability, but now we've really also included a lot of different populations, whether that's military, veterans, LGBTQIA, neurodivergent, people with disabilities, deaf, blind, and hard of hearing. There's a long list of people that, of diverse people that, that join our programs. And so our office staff has grown in that time as well. We have different focus areas. So there's day programs, what we call extended trips, and then our military and veterans programs. Those are all, all those different teams look at organizations that we can partnership partner with to create uh, different trips. And it, a lot of people think we only focus on the United States, but we actually have programming all around the United States and some international programming programs as well. So we've gone to many national parks like Olympic, Yellowstone, Beartooth, and then of course Boundary Waters and the Apostle Islands are major areas for us. We go out to Utah. There, there's so many different places. So and then when we look internationally, we've gone to places like Iceland and uh, Kenya. So we really want people anywhere to experience these, experience the outdoors and have that opportunity. We do get different funding that we can support people, whether that's through accessibility needs or financial aid. So as an organization, we're trying to break down barriers of any kind. Um, so that could be that could be we help you with fundraising support yourself. That could be us uh, getting grants and scholarships to provide that type of support. So sometimes that means that participants don't pay anything. And sometimes that means they split the costs. Um, and then we also are able to, during those trips, provide different adaptive equipment. And we really believe that you know it doesn't matter what your background or your ability, we think anybody should be able to experience the outdoors. And 
following up, up on that. How, how do you prepare participants for having a great first experience? What's some of that preparatory work that Wilderness Inquiry does for that? So through the registration process, we'll typically know their health history and, and they fill out a form. And whether that's the first time or they're very experienced in the wilderness, we try to gather all of that information. And then that information goes to our trip directors. And a trip director's role is really to meet and discuss with, with the group how they can kind of lay out a plan for the trip to make sure it's safe and logistically make sense for everybody and, and meet those accomm accommodations. So we want to make sure those participants are really feeling comfortable for, before they leave. And we also like to ask them if there's any activities that they really want to do, whether that's fishing, hiking, kayaking, all the different activities. And that will also depend on the location and the weather. And of course, in the winter, we do things like dog sledding on the Quincy building, like I'd mentioned before. And some people want to experience sleeping in a Quincy. We, we don't provide that opportunity, but we do try to look at, you know, in the snow, different animal tracks. And we try to describe the different birds or listen for different birds. So our activities are a huge range. And that's for extended trips specifically. For day trips, that's going to focus more on water quality testing and building skills um, in the outdoors. We also will sometimes have experiences with fishing and canoeing. Um, and that'll be more in a local waterway that they live nearby or that they live close to. And then we also look at orienteering and how to use compasses and read a map so they can understand when they're out hiking what the elevation game might be and how to use that compass to find north, things like that as well. So there's a huge variety of curriculum and teaching that's involved in those day programs. And so those are both can be catered to people who want to just get started and feel comfortable in the outdoors, as well as people who have a lot of experience. And, and, uh, Sean, so you, you've, uh, mentioned how you, you established that nonprofit, uh, adaptive wilderness to complement uh, the, um, uh, the north of north uh, resort that you have there i mean maybe talk about what you're trying to offer there and uh you know and if people people watching this wanted to participate themselves or or send others there talk about how people can get in touch get in touch with you there yeah they can uh, go to our website and uh, send us a note right there on the contact form and reach out um we have a lot of people reaching out um, all the time, which has been really exciting. Um, we um, have a different model. Um, I'd say we're sort of the micro um, uh, side of things. Uh, you know, uh, no no aspirations for an event with 400 people uh, on our side of things. Uh, but we've had about 40 participants here in the last couple months, um, and so we're you know steady um, with folks. And some of that is wild rice harvest other groups that'll sometimes take over the whole resort um, all at once, which is a, a great experience for folks. But um, we do have um, funds for the next several years that uh, are already set aside to start paying for um, folks to experience, you know, um, what you can really do in Northern Minnesota out of our location, um, which it, it we're looking at. Uh, getting people in the water. So we have these adaptive kayaks. Um, we have a fleet of adaptive kayaks that have outriggers and things that can help with uh, uh, hand function and grip strength. And so they're kind of designed for someone who would be up to a, a cervical level uh, quadriplegia uh, that had limited hand function. Um, we have a, a new investment in a pontoon as well uh, for folks who are going to be getting out there through our guides at CAST who are taking people um, uh, out fishing and kayaking um, on a weekly basis now at this point. So um, 
that's kind of wrapping up now though. Um, we're pulling in the boats and uh, switching over things. This will be kind of one of our last weekends. We have a, a group actually of uh, uh, soldiers actually um, from Ukraine up there this weekend who are uh, recovering and uh, uh, they've uh, recovered from their injuries and now they're learning how to use their uh, prosthetics, their new prosthetic uh, uh, limbs and doing fishing and they're gonna do a dog sled uh, run, a dry run uh, uh, on land to, to learn how to, how to uh, do that and it's all about working as a team and um and 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 so we've got some kind of special event going on there this weekend but um as the winter goes on it's yeah we're transitioning into the dog sledding uh we have an adaptive sit ski and sauna weekend we're in the midst of planning uh one thing that we did at the resort is they don't sell a, a sauna that can be accessible to a wheelchair so we uh, went through the uh, pain of uh, adapting uh, sauna, and but we've we've created saunas that are uh, roll-in saunas and very friendly for wheelchairs and accessible. And so, you know, uh, we can get out there and we can get cold and we can heat up just like everybody else now. And so, yeah, I mean, really, it's a place for for everyone. Um, but if you've got someone in your life who's uh, you know has mobility issues, especially, uh, the, they'll really really appreciate this place uh, where we've made uh, the paths and the boardwalk and the docks and the saunas and the decks and the units and all the appliances, all of it uh, work for for everybody. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we're, we we just uh, our our. our what we're trying to deliver here is sort of that quintessential Minnesota cabin experience. People, you know, you're in the office and what are you doing this weekend? What are you doing this weekend? And you hear that people, I'm going up to a cabin. I rented a place here. I did this. You know, um, that's just a conversation that folks with disabilities, it's been a much more difficult conversation to have as far as where could we go? Where could we do this? And so, you know, with our grants, we're really trying to deliver on that. People are, our, our model is for people to come up with their support systems, with their friends, with their family, and, and do a trip together with our guides. And, um, you know, not really, not really trying to push people outside of their comfort zone. It's my personal belief that most people, many people with significant disabilities, uh, are constantly stretched beyond their comfort zone by life. And, uh, and really uh, getting back to your question, what does nature mean? It's, it's that healing, it's the calm. I want people to have great experiences like dog sledding and fishing and kayaking that are not next to anxious thoughts in their brain about, is this going to work for me? Is this is the setup right? You know, uh, what are the facilities going to be like? What are the guides are going to be like? Uh, and so we're trying to just eliminate those, uh, kind of negative uh, things that, that can come with uh, pushing yourself, you know, in, in new ways, so. so great, Sean. So you have uh, uh, groups such as the, the group of Ukrainian soldiers, but you mentioned the support uh, network and families. So so families could, uh, could come up as well, maybe talk about that. We are almost all families, really. Um, this is a unique thing um, um, with this group. Um, you know, we, we get a lot of people that come either with their families uh, or friends, uh, a lot of folks uh, who are in there with, with their friends as well. We've had people come from uh, Colorado. Uh, we've had people come from Las Vegas. I have someone coming from Florida uh, here. So, you know, uh, you know, it's it's not just Minnesotans that, you know, haven't been able to access this type of uh you know, Northwoods experience. It's folks from all over the all over the country. So, you know, it's a great thing for our state, our economy, just to you know make sure that we uh, we we include everybody. We build an inclusive uh, economy around the boundary waters, especially. It's, it's frankly one of our state's greatest resources. So, super. Thanks, and and Riss uh, with wilderness inquiry we uh through our no boundaries to the boundary waters education program we partner with wilderness inquiry to deliver it for high school students uh here in minnesota to have uh wilderness great wilderness experiences maybe talk about the different ages and uh that that you serve as well is it uh, just uh, what what ages do you serve at, at wilderness inquiry and, and your in your program there 
So wilderness inquiry has a huge range of ages that we'll provide experiences to from newborns all the way up to 100 years old. It doesn't matter. So we set up kind of a role where we, we want to make sure people feel safe. Um, for example, if a family wants to bring a baby and that baby is under 30 pounds, they'll need to provide their own approved life jacket. If it's over, you know, that 30 pound Coast Guard approved limit, then we can provide our own. So that's like one change that would happen with the equipment. But outside of that, really any age can join our programs. We do often see senior citizens uh, joining our Boundary Waters trips. They tend to really enjoy having those guided trips. Um, but yeah, but really any, any age group. Uh, uh, Riss, uh, um, you, you mentioned that uh, the, that Wilderness Inquiry is developing a program with veterans and uh, maybe expand on that or what are some of the, the special needs and, and special programs that you're, uh, you have for, for veterans since we're so close to Veterans Day here? Yep, so we partner with Blue Star Families I don't know if you all are familiar with that organization or not, but they are a big military organization and military family organization. So we provide different programs and experiences where they can connect to the outdoors. And with that organization specifically, we've set up military family organization, MFO is what we call it internally, um, to set up trips where families who either have a veteran in their family or they're currently serving in the military, they can all connect with other families who have that same shared experience. And that's been a really successful program for us so far. We're looking to continue and grow that program in 2025 and really have pretty big plans for next summer for that. Sean, you mentioned some Ukrainian soldiers will be up at uh, at your resort this weekend. How did they How did they come uh, come to find you? Uh, through through just communications uh, th through the nonprofit, we just got connected with this foundation. So we're just uh, we've been hitting the media circuit and getting out there. Um, you know, we were on Kathy Wurzer's program, and that definitely um, gave us a bump. And so we're just we're spreading the word by. Um, you know, through through a lot of the times the media, but also just connecting with other organizations. I can't really think of precisely where they where they connected with us at the moment. But um, you know, the nonprofit is um, new, and so you know, we we really are looking for you know help to spread the word. And so we're you know we don't have the the, the great history that, uh, you know, you, you highlighted there for Wilderness Inquiry going back, um, you know, to the 1970s, I think you were saying, Riz, uh, if I'm a good student. Uh, so, um, yeah, I, I, you know, help us spread the word. Um, we are uh, primarily focused on folks with physical disabilities. Um, and uh, we um, are really trying, we're, we're, we're prioritizing folks in Minnesota uh, for use of our funds, but we also are trying to keep things going all the time. And so, you know, we'll, we'll uh, uh, certainly entertain folks from outside of the state, uh, outside of the area to come in and participate as well. Um, so yeah, please, please help us spread the word. With respect to the resort though, Chris, I, one thing I just try to make sure everybody understands that uh, it's a place for everybody. We designed it with universal design, but that uh, it's even been kind of disappointing to sometimes hear good friends when I was opening it up say, oh, that's, you built a camp for disabled people. And uh, that's all they say. It's like, no, you missed there. You, you, did not, you didn't quite get it. Uh, we built a place for everybody. 
uh, where people can have integrated experiences. Uh, so, you know, if you, if you're not disabled, but you bring your family there, uh, you might see someone who's disabled. Sure. Um, maybe that's a good thing for your family, um, and for, for everybody. Uh, we believe it is. And, um, so, you know, it's, it's really supposed to be, you know, you can imagine how painful it might be to, if you take disability and you swap it out with a race, what if we built a, this, a, a resort just for someone of a certain race? Well, that, that right away hits us as well. That's not okay. Um, so, you know, think of it in that terms, uh, you know, realize that, uh, supporting uh, a business that uh, values universal design is a, is, a, is a good thing for our communities. And it's a, an important point to make that this is really about um, uh, integration and not segregation here that have an in, in, in integrated approach there. And, and uh, uh, were there some experiences from, from your life experiences that kind of uh, led you to, to think that way or anything anything that resonates from your past that made you made you think that way or well i guess maybe i have the curse and the benefit of uh growing up able-bodied and, and uh, frankly uh ignorant to um you know the perspective of uh of, of you know a person with a disability of course all that's changed and you know <laughs> uh, many many years and i still have a lot to learn frankly but uh you know, having that empathy, just realizing what would a disabled person want? Well, they wouldn't want to have a resort built that was, you know, only going to be disabled people there. They want to have experiences with people with all types of backgrounds, right? And this isn't the only thing about their personality. This is just one aspect of their personality. And so, uh, you know, making all of our cabins accessible, again, means that nobody's taking an accessible cabin from someone else. And, uh, and they can count on, you know, ha ha us, us, you know, doing doing the right thing when it comes to uh, how we how we prioritize our business because we we set aside time for uh, the the you know wild rice harvest and we set aside times for the nonprofit events and then and then in the meantime we're we're a business where anyone can go and you know maybe just grandpa is having to, you know, you know experience uh wants a cabin experience and people are nervous of how it's going to work out i've uh i've got someone coming up who has als who's going dog sledding you know uh, with their family and their family's coming from all over the country so you know sometimes folks aren't even interested in the nonprofit side of things they just look at this as a place where they can they can use it uh, other times people are uh, really limited from a financial standpoint and it's clear that you know this is not an experience that they're ever going to get um, and, and of course, that's where, as a nonprofit, our priority is is to is to try to uh, make it happen for folks with more limited means. Great, and yeah, uh, thank you, Sean. There were some questions to that effect about uh, whether your your resort is open to people, you know, with uh, age related uh, uh, limit disabilities and, and the like. And so that's that's yeah. you, the answer is yes. You know, that hundred percent. We're open to everybody, and we're a young business. We're stabilizing still. Uh, any resort takes several years to really stabilize, and so frankly, the prices are as good as they'll probably ever be. And uh, <laughs> and it's a great place for anybody to come right now, regardless of your abilities. And uh, you know, so. Yeah, please do come out and support us. Great, thank you. And Riz, where where do you see uh, your program at Wilderness Inquiry evolving? Do you see, uh, you know, there, is there a, another? What's the next chapter for for you and 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 then in Wilderness Inquiry? Ooh, that's a hard question. Really, that evol evolution over the years, we've seen a lot already up to this point. And so now it's just really trying to figure out how to grow and, and serve more diverse populations. We're already in the process of opening some new staff positions for folks to come join our organization. So we're growing as a staff, which is exciting as well. And I feel like the future just looks like growth for us, you know, adding more focused areas, specific programs dedicated to different groups. 
And I feel like maybe 10 years from now, wilderness inquiry, yes, we'll have that growth, but that'll really mean growing outside of the unit, outside of the state of Minnesota as well. So maybe there'll be more national organizations. And I'm personally very much hoping to connect with different schools for the deaf around the country and, and try to get them to join our programs. And then trying to add to some new destinations for folks as well. And so we're trying to get creative in, in how we can connect to different populations. And then we're part of a Interpreting Forward uh, program in Minnesota, which, oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, okay, so people interpret um, accessibility differently. So we're really trying to clarify what that accessibility means. And because it's such a broad term and, and you know, that can mean a lot of different things, whether it's cultural accessibility, emotional accessibility, mental health. Um, it can include a lot of things beyond just communication and physical accessibility. So we're trying to build a community that understands that as well and trying to get them and, and to enjoy the outdoors. Great, thank you. Um, you know, one of the limitations people often place on themselves for enjoying the outdoors is that it's just for the summer or fall and, and that's it. And uh, now that we're entering the, the winter season here, uh, talk up, uh, Bruce, talk about what access to the winter means means to you and, and for Wilderness Inquiry. Oh, yes. That's a really good example of why we recently were showing that ASL Winter Fest photo. That's one way that we can get a lot of folks outside in the winter, especially for the deaf, deaf, blind, and hard of hearing community. Maybe they don't know how to experience it themselves. They just stay home. They always, you know, stay indoors. And we're trying to encourage them, no, there's so many different things you can do. And so we have um, different organizations that join. And this year, I'm really excited in our third year, we have REI joining us. We have the Conservation Corps of Minnesota and Iowa, uh, the Fort Stelling State Park, the National Park Service, and a lot of other community organizations that partner with us to support that event. So that we really see that as a relationship building opportunity, but then also they can try things like fat tire biking. They can try snowshoeing or walking on the ice and drilling the hole themselves with the auger. So a lot of different things that they'll be able to experience and feel comfortable in the outdoors in the winter. So that way they can see and shift that perspective of it's only a summer and fall thing, like you said. No, this is year round. They can enjoy that. You, uh, Maggie, maybe we could share the uh, one of the pictures of of uh, uh, of Sean's resort there, so that people can get a uh, revisit that again here for a moment, and uh, you know, kind of showing showing some of the facilities there. So, yeah, we had recently the sportsmen for the Boundary Waters were out to, to shoot a little thing and. They're local, of course, and they've been in all the different uh, resorts. And they said they were willing to put in print that this is the nicest accommodations in, in Ely. And that really warmed my heart. We've got heated concrete floors there, so it's really toasty in the winter. Of course, this screen and porch is key in June when the mosquito is trying to carry you away. All the saunas have uh, magnificent views um, of the forest and the lake. They're all accessible, as I said. Uh, to anybody. And uh, this boardwalk is just a treasure. Uh, when you walk out at uh, day or night, night is really a fun experience to be under the stars uh, on top of the marsh. Um, of course, you know, uh, the Boundary Waters uh, are famous for our Northern Lights shows. This went in the day we put the boardwalk in. I consider that a very good omen. We had that May uh, storm that came and gave us these incredible views. So, um, 
the cool thing is when you get on the other side of this point, you can't see the units and you can't see anything. It's just a 360 degree panorama of wilderness and lake. And um, that's really the, the really special thing is the solitude and the quiet. I, I, uh, my last customer a couple of weeks ago said, Sean, you're not selling a resort. You're selling peace and solitude and tranquility. And, uh, you know, it's just uh, he was from Wisconsin and just couldn't believe what we, we have up here. So. And it is year round. I love that you said that comment about year round. You know, um, a lot of folks seem to be really excited for winter time. Um, who know because the cross country skiing up here is just amazing. And uh, of course, ice fishing and dog sledding, all the activities you can do uh, right out of the resort. So we have uh, discounted packages on rentals if people want to rent a fat bike or rent a snow set of snowshoes or skis or any of that. We can we can. Uh, facilitate all that for you. Great. So you'll be having uh dog sledding and snowshoeing right from right from your location there. Right from, right the, from location. the location. They'll bring the dogs right to the resort and they'll run them right up and down the lake uh for you. And we've got discounted rates to do so with the guides. And so uh we've that 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 seems to be one of the most <laughs> The favorite things right now for people booking to try to uh, coordinate with us is these type of experiences. But um, the Birch Lake does have groomed trails on it, and um, and so it will be a, a great place for cross country skiers to to launch out of uh, for the winter too. Great, and Maggie, maybe if you want to go to the 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 water scenes of that show the cabin and and. And the and the in Birch Lake and the Quishery River there a bit so people get a sense of it. I know there was a question about do, do you have your uh, own uh, ski? Uh, what you can do is you can it, it, there and and maybe the one after that. Well, right, right there is it's a good one. You you'll be able to ski right from from here. There you go. Kind of right, yeah. Right 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 along uh, right on the river. That was as you said the hard hard water season. As hard water season. Said. Yeah, exactly. And you know. We can have uh, a fishing guide come up and set up tip ups all along from the boardwalk there and people can basically, you know, walk up and down the boardwalk and monitor their fishing and go back up and take a sauna and it's 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 kind of a new level of uh, development uh, in the boundary waters. Uh, of course, we're, uh, you know, taking advantage of all the modern uh, materials Our our structures are built with uh, called a sip panel and the walls are about eight inches, 10 inches thick, and uh, you can heat them with a candle is the claim. Uh, extremely energy efficient uh, structures. And um, so, uh, you know, we're able to keep things open all year round and uh, and even in the harshest of the winter. And, uh, and it, I can say that this is a really, truly beautiful landscape in the winter time. I was just looking back for our social, for some posts of our past winter pictures and your ability to see into the woods so, and, and see all the cliffs and rocks and everything. It's just a, the landscape just transforms. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Maggie, if you take that picture down, please. Well, we're uh, near the end of our time here. And uh, Riz, I wanted to give an opportunity for, you know, some, some final thoughts uh, from you on, on the outdoors and accessibility to the outdoors and, uh, and wilderness inquiry. So some final thoughts from you. So really, I'm so grateful for connecting with you, Sean, and, and learning about what you've set up up at near the Boundary Waters and your organization and nonprofit as well, and how you're really trying to take down barriers. And it's so cool to see that growth, you know, before there was nothing and, and look what you've created there and what you've built. So I think that's really exciting to learn from you. And, and I look forward to myself, hopefully partnering with you and, ex and experiencing it up there. Likewise, I look forward to the same, definitely. And, uh, it's an inspiration to hear all the work you're doing uh, and, you know, the great impact of your program. So um, I, I, 
know our paths will cross again. I said, I wanted to say hope, but I know they will. And I wanted to thank, uh, you know, friends of the Boundary Waters, you know, um, you know, you're an ally um, to us all. And, uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, protecting these places for everybody and, and recognizing, uh, you know, the DEI aspect of wilderness is, uh, is, is kind of a, I don't want to say it's a new thing, but it's, it's, it's becoming um, certainly you know, getting more attention. And uh, thanks for being part of that. Well, thank you so much, Sean. And and Maggie, if you put up the final slide here for uh, for people, there's a couple important things uh, on the calendar coming up here. And so there's two things. Uh, as uh, some of you may know, that uh, we're approaching Give to the Max Day, which is uh, next Thursday, November 21st. Uh, you can give early now. Uh, the, the link is in the, the chat uh, uh, button there. So uh, please uh, avail yourself to that. So give to the Max Day. Uh, we, and I want to thank all the supporters that have donated uh, to that. Uh, and on Tuesday, December 10th, we're going to have a legislative kickoff event here uh, in the evening at 630. And this is open to citizens as, as well as a, be a number of uh, elected officials at that. As Sean mentioned, directly underneath his property and across across from his property is the proposed uh, twin metals copper nickel sulfide mine. And we've been in, in court for uh, the last several years and have been very active in trying to uh, educate our elected officials to pass legislation that will protect the, the wilderness that uh, Riz and Sean spoke so eloquently about. And so it's part of our advocacy work. And, and so this legislative kickoff event, it's free. You can come to our office and meet with legislators and we'll talk about things uh, going forward. And so if you uh, can take that down now, uh, Maggie, for a moment. And I am, I just wanna express my heartfelt thanks to to Riz and uh, Alyssa and, and Sean and uh, for, for this uh, great, uh, it was a wonderful hour to spend with you and uh, for everyone that was joining. Thank you so much. Uh, our our members are and our supporters are the, the strength of our organization and the word of, uh, about connection to the the wilderness and connection to other people uh, ran ran through this program. So thank you for sharing your hour with us as well and making these connections. So uh, have a wonderful afternoon. Uh, thank you again to to Riz and Alyssa and Sean. Um, we're very very grateful. Thank you well. Take care. Thank you so much. See you up north, everyone. Right.